Good afternoon, everyone. How are you today? It's a pleasure to make your acquaintance. My name is Frank Lee. I serve as head butler to the Washington family. Yes, there's not much going on on the property right now. The missus and the general are away in Philadelphia right now with their two children. If there's a bit of a bug going about the state of Virginia and different parts of the world, for that reason, they have those of us here at Mount Vernon practicing this thing called social distancing. I don't really know what it entails, but I'm sure it's rather important. <laughs> They've given us these masks right here to wear upon our faces. I don't care too much for the fact, but it does a good job at having a five o'clock shot on my face when I don't feel like shaving. As, as you can imagine, being here at Mount Vernon, we have beautiful landscaping. Yes, when the sun hits it at a certain angle, it's bright and sunny. Very nice, I must say. One of my favorite areas is the East Lawn. I could spend out there forever and watch the stretch of water that makes up the Potomac River. It seems to go on forever in a day. It's, you have the Fort Washington area on the far left. You have the Akakeek area on the right across the river. You have Quantico on the far right. I love that name. Quantico. It just slips off my tongue very nicely. Quantico. <laughs> yes, my wife and I, we occasionally, in between all that we have to do, like to just stand out there and admire the view. Speaking of my wife, she was making a big old fuss about nothing in particular today. In between all that random raving, I managed to go to the upper garden and have someone give me one of those lovely flowers that have a beautiful ray from all walks of life. I went back over to the room in which we have raised our family, kissed the top of her forehead, and said, Woman, you are as beautiful as a dewdrop on the rose in the summertime. Uh, they put a big smile on the face. I keep that up. I might be able to get one more child from her, and I don't mind one bit. We have three children, Michael, Philip, and Patty. They're 17, 14, and nine years of age. Patty's coming up on her ninth birthday. I call her Miss Patty because she reminds me of my wife. Very feisty in her approach to people. Yes, indeed. I call them morning, afternoon, and evening. Three totally different personalities, but I love them equally. But I give a little extra special care to my only daughter because she's my only little girl. And I look in the eyes of my children sometimes and I aspire for a life, a better life. But they can be free and live accordingly, you see. My brother and I, we never had such accessibilities. I don't like to necessarily call it a privilege. You see, my brother and I, we were raised in Camp Point, which is in Westmoreland County, Virginia. It's about 80 miles from here, not too far from where the general was born and raised by his father, Augustine. Well, we were raised by Colonel John Lee and his wife, Mary. We were purchased by them, I guess you could say. We were given basic tasks, how to fetch water, how to fetch milk. I remember that being one particular task that was given to me at the age of seven years old. You see, they had a swing right above the dining room table. They used to raise peacocks on their property with these long, flowing tails of green, blue, and indigo. Very nice, beautiful birds. Well, at the age of seven, they would remove these feathers from these birds and make handmade fans, and they put me over in this swing, and they would have me maneuver it back and forth on the family meal, been ever so careful not to spill any of the wine on the expensive linens they decorate the table. Quite interesting indeed. <laughs> Well, when I was 14 and my brother was about 17 years of age, the dead Lord took the life of Colonel John Lee and Miss Mary didn't have too much of a use for us. So she allowed the general, through her association with him, to purchase my brother and I, along with two other young men. I myself, I was purchased for the price of three good horses at that time, which was $50. My brother, however, was set at a much higher rate, probably because of his physical aesthetic and his skill with horses. He's always been a skilled horseman. He was set at $62. And we were brought here, and we've known here as home ever since. I must say, I was quite concerned about what our fate would be. You see, I had heard many rumors being spread around, even at a young age, that the general would oftentimes separate families, and there is a bit of truth behind it. You see, the general believes that you should live where you work. For example, I have a fellow friend, his name is Joe. He serves as a ditch digger here at Mansion House. Now, this is one of the busier farms. We have close to 100 people that reside here on a daily basis. Now, he has a wife, Priscilla. Priscilla is what they know her as in Doe Run, which is about three, four miles from this property. Now, they have six children between the both of them, one for almost every day of the week, my goodness. Now, they have a log cabin, which has been allotted to them temporarily by the general. Now, they both work sun up to sundown. Now, Priscilla works as a field worker over there. He works as a ditch digger here, irrigating waters, making sure that they flow properly along the, the grass and whatnot. Now, if they both work sun up to sundown, who's taking care of the children? 
That's very much a reality for most people here in the enslaved community. There are 316 of us that make up the enslaved community. Now, the general, he owns a little over 120. The mistress, however, owns about a little over 150 by default. You see, she was married before she met the general. She had four children. Unfortunately, she lost two. God rest their souls. And he took them in as his own because he wasn't able to have children, if you know what I mean. Well, he loves them just as much as he loves himself and his and his wife, I must say. Well, upon our arrival, as look what happened, my brother and I, we were in an area in which we were allowed to stay together temporarily. You see, the general took a quick liking to my brother and he became personal manservant, which meant that he had to get up as early as four o'clock in the morning, very much like myself, <laughs> to make sure that the general was well suited for the day, to make sure that his horses were saddled. Occasionally, the general likes to engage in a little bit of fox hunting right before the breaking up fast at seven o'clock in the morning. Now, he's very particular about when meals happen. Breaking up the fast usually happens at around seven o'clock in the morning. Dinner usually happens around three o'clock in the afternoon. Now, why things happen so early in the day is beyond me, but I'm not one to concern you about such things, but you are here to be entertained and entertained you shall be. Well, I started out as a bit of an assistant in the kitchen. That's where I met my wife, Miss Lucy. At the time, her mother, Doll, was working as head cook. She had a sister named Alcy, but I took more of a liking to Lucy. It was my first experience at knowing what love was. Yes. I remember when I almost lost my wife. Hmm. You see, there was a captain of a ship that parked itself on the other side of the Potomac River. That ship was called the HMS Savage. Now, Ron Washington, who was a distant cousin of the general, he was an overseer at the time. Well, the general, he was over in the Continental Army during this period. Well, this captain of the ship decided that he wanted certain proprieties from the property that Lund was not willing to give him so easily. So as a form of intimidation, he decided to burn some of the property on the Atticuke side. Well, living in fear that that very thing may happen to Mount Vernon, he gave in to his demands. Well, he called on some of the enslaved to assist him in giving this man some of those proprieties. Well, a total of 17 went on to the ship, but 17 didn't come off. You see, they made it as far as your Pennsylvania, from my understanding, including my wife. I must say, I was quite concerned and heartbroken at the same time. But as the good Lord would have it, she was returned, along with six others. Yes. And despite her feelings on returning back to the property, I followed one of the commandments of the Bible, be fruitful and multiply in hopes that she would never again be my fragile heart. And she brought me three children. We have a room right above the kitchen. My wife, she serves as head cook, you see. And because we're always at the beck and call of the Washington family, we have such a space given to us temporarily. You see, I've been told that a hired housekeeper by the name of Mrs. Forbes will soon be occupying that space. Now, where the general has in store for us to live, I do not know. But I do hope that we are not separated like many families here. Now, the room itself, it's small, a bit quaint, but we make do as best we can. It has two sections. Now, the first section has sandstone flooring, a fireplace, a table, and two chairs. You have 13 steps that lead up to two small rooms and three large windows that overlook the front of the property, such as the bowling green. <laughs> I don't care too much for that bowling green. I must tell you, it's a bit of an eyesore if you ask me. But the pigeons don't seem to have a problem with doing their business in the public eye, if you know what I mean. As I do love my wife, and I do know a reality that a lot do not know, and that is that the general is soon to give my brother his freedom upon his passing. You see, because my brother worked as personal manservant for 20 years, 20 long years, he even served all seven years in the in the wars, revolutionary wars. Now, he didn't serve in battle. He didn't have any form of artillery, but he did serve as a bit of a spy. He did attend to the needs of many soldiers who did and died during that time. Well, he is to receive his freedom immediately in this will. You see, I managed to overhear a conversation that he was having, the general, that is, no one of the family meals. Now, those of us who are owned under him will be passed on to the missus. Now, if she passes on, and I do not wish any physical ill harm to her, but when she does, unfortunately, those who are owned under her will be sent back over to Woodlawn and Arlington House, two properties that are owned by her grandchildren. 
Well, my wife and my three children will be separated from me. Right now, I choose not to think about such things. Well, I am very grateful that they are here now. But I think about those moments where we may very well be separated, and we will. In which case, I hope that I will be able to maintain my position as head butler here. But I'd rather stay here than elsewhere. Outside of my brother, my family is the only family that I've ever known. I've always been estranged from my mother and father, you see. We were considered as mulatto or mixed race. I remember that it was often implied that Colonel John Lee may very well be my father, which was all the more reason why we were given accessibilities of the, within the property in which we were raised on. You see, 6% of the population here at Mount Vernon is considered as mulatto. So if you are a waiter, a cook, a seamstress, or a butler, you will work local within the mansion. I'm sure that some of the people that work outside of the property seem to think that life for me and the many others that work within the mansion is a lot better. That's so not the case. They're at least given one day of salvation to be with their family. I have, I work seven days a week as well as my wife. I don't get a chance to see my children grow up and they are growing like tumbleweeds every day before my very eyes. Right now, my oldest child, I'm training him up over within the mansion. <laughs> I assume he's going to be a waiter at some point. So I'm teaching him the ins and outs, how to properly set the linen, how to clean the silverware, things of that nature. That's one of my main responsibilities. As you can imagine, being hit, but I'm a man of many tasks, waiting on the family doing meals, watching over the estate's dogs. There are several different breeds that they're quite fond of, such as Newfoundlands, Terriers, Foxhounds. I monitor the storage of foods and wines over within the cellar on both sides of the mansion. I do everything except for sit down. One particular task that I have is separating the guests accordingly in the central passage, you see. Now, we do have many people to visit here. Last year alone, we had close to 677 overnight stays over in that their mansion. My goodness. During that time, I often implied to the general that we have dinner outdoors instead of indoors, but he didn't really find it funny. But be quite honest with you, as hot as it's been lately this summer, I don't really find it funny either. Yes. Well, I have to wear this uniform in which to do my job. Now, this is not necessarily something that I would pick out for myself, but I managed to make it work. It's known as livery. It's a part of the new European fashions, the general says. It's modeled after a three-piece suit, so you have your breeches, you have your vest, and you have your jacket. Now, form-fitting is what he thinks it is. <clears throat> Ugly and unattractive is what I think it is. Now, you have the two colors in which decorate the uniform, red and cream. These are known as coat of arms. If you're not familiar with such things, they are colors that decorate an heirloom. In this case, you have these two colors that have been passed down from generation to generation within the Washington family. However, they also serve as a means of letting the people such as yourselves know that I am considered as property of the Washington family. Well, as I said earlier, because I can ramble on all day, I was speaking about my brother. As a matter of fact, I was hoping to speak to him a little earlier within the day, but he seemed to be out and about doing his job. He's very busy, very much like myself. He was recently returned as the shoemaker. You see, I said he worked once as personal manservant to the general. Unfortunately, he's been returned because at the end of the Revolutionary Wars and upon their return to Philadelphia, he acquired several different accidents to his left kneecap, which unfortunately did not allow him to move out as much anymore. Well, it was through the recommendation of Tobias Lee, who serves as personal secretary to the general, as well as a few other suitors, that he be given a position that was more accommodating to his needs, less taxing on the body, in which case he now serves as shoemaker. As you can imagine, his spirit is broken. He's quite upset about such a decision being made. But in between all that I have to do, I try to visit him and assure him that it is not the job that makes the man the guy, but the man with his position. Right now, he doesn't see it that way, but I know my brother eventually he will. He's rather stubborn and honoring his approach to things at times. My wife tries to visit him whenever she can to uplift his spirits with the teachings of the Bible. That's how many people here at Mount Vernon learn how to read. We have a fellow enslaved man by the name of Caesar who likes to come by and teach people the word. Now, some listen, some choose not. They have their own practices that they would rather follow. We do have slave quarters here for those who 
have to live where they work, such as Joe. Yes. Have close to 50 to 60 men and women that reside in those front rooms. Now you have eight beds. Now you do the math. Have 50 to 60 over in two rooms. Eight bunk beds. Some have to sleep on the floor. Sometimes you have three to four, maybe five people at the foot and at the head of those beds, and those beds are not comfortable at all. Well, I am very fortunate that I am not in such a situation with my family. But as I said earlier, I do hope that we are not separated once this Mrs. Forbes arrives on the property. Well, neither here nor there, I don't want to bore you anymore with any, any of my journeys or my experiences. If you by some chance have any questions, any inquiries, anything at all I can give assistance with, please feel free to ask. As I like to tell people, I don't bite unless I'm instructed to do so. Thank you, frankly. We do have a lot of questions for you and a lot of people tuning in and saying thank you for sharing your story. Folks from Texas, Virginia, California, Ohio, Ecuador, all over. Um, we've had questions about your brother, Billy Lee, but you've told us quite a bit about him. Um, and if he, somebody asked, uh, Jonathan asked, didn't Billy Lee break both legs near the end of Washington's life? Yes, indeed he did, yes. And between his time he had working on the property, he did acquire even more accidents to his both left and knee and right kneecaps, which unfortunately did not allow him to move about as much anymore, any more than he was able to when he was brought back to the property. Now that is a very discouraging thing to experience as a man. But I, as I said, I try to visit him as often as I can to try to lift his spirits. Despite his feelings on returning back to the property, I'm quite glad to be reunited. Him, or he's the only family I've ever known outside of one I've established for myself. Very good. And Dennis asks, um, how many suits of clothing do you receive a year? Well, most of the people that work outside of the mansion, they're given one uniform. For the men, that means they will get one top or one shift. They will get wool pants. They will get a wool jacket, one pair of stockings, a pair of shoes with a uh, gold buckle along the top, and during the winter, during the summer seasons, they will get linen pants. Now, for the women, they will get a linen skirt for the summer, but during the winter, they will get a wool skirt. They will get two shifts or two tops. They will get a pair of stockings, black pattern of the shoes with a gold buckle along the front, very much like the men, and they will get a couple of blankets. And Clay asks, frankly, were you paid a wage for your labor? Well, no. For well, I am considered as property of the Washington family. I'm treated no more than the no better than the Oxford pigs or the, the horses or the flock of sheep that exist here along the property. Yes, but I try to muster up as much diligence and pride as I can throughout my days to get through them. And Jeremy asks, oh, could you tell us about your clothes? Well, the clothes in which I wear, as I stated earlier, they're known as livery. It's a part of the new European fashions. Uh, it's modeled after a three-piece suit. Well, you have the breeches, and you have the vest, and you have the jacket, three pieces. And you have the colors in which decorate the uniform that is known as coat of arms. Uh, you have cream, and you have red. Now, both colors have been passed down from generation to generation within the Washington family, but it also serves as a means of letting many people know that I am considered as property of the Washington family. And Jim asks, what was it like working with George Washington? Well, I wouldn't know, to be quite honest with you. Well, I, I do know, but he's not here as much. We do have a lot of, see, a lot of overseers that monitor the property. Sometimes they overstep their boundaries at times and they correct some of the enslaved. Yes, indeed. And Cynthia asks, um, as, as a butler for George Washington, would you have had any occasion to meet other butlers from neighboring estates? Uh, no, ma'am. I spent most of my time here along the property. I have so many things to do. I can't keep my head on straight. Is in between monitoring those who work over within the mansion, taking care of things over within the cellar, taking care of the many guests. When we do have the Washington family here, I do not have such 
luxurious to travel back and forth. My brother has been able to travel to many places along with the general for but how have I not? And uh, Marius, have you ever had a casual conversation with anyone in the Washington family? Well, no, I try to keep myself busy at all times. My present is omnipresent, which means I am there, but I am not there within their eyes. So a lot of private conversations are oftentimes had in and around me during the family meals. I know a lot more than most other people, but I dare not speak out loud about such things to certain people, for I fear the circumstances that may occur from doing so. And JD asks, how are the living conditions for the enslaved people on the plantation? Well, there's not as good as some of these time travelers that I've heard about that have these fancy homes with things called air conditioning and fancy square box two-way mirror devices called iPhones and Androids and whatnot. Well, it's very simple. They have bunk rooms. They have about eight beds in them. They have well over 50 people that reside in both areas, one for the men, one for the women. As well, the lining of the bed is no more than uh, the sticks or feathers or linen itself. And Joe, uh, Pe uh, Petit asks, do you have any time for leisure? If so, what did you do with it? Did you choose to spend time with Washington? No, I choose to spend time with my family. I work close to seven days a week. Well, during that time, I like to watch my children frolic along the property. They're the only ones that have accessibility open in the upper and lower garden. That's where my wife spends most of her time over in the lower garden where she gets fruits and vegetables. The missus, she's very particular about when we have meals and having fresh fruits and vegetables on the table at all times. And we have a question from Joe. Were you with George Washington during his battles? Oh, no, sir. That was my brother, William. He once served as personal manservant to the general for about 20 years of his life. Yes, he was about 17 when he was put over into that position. The general took a quick liking to him and he put him over within that particular task. But that meant that he had to work longer hours. And, but however, he got to travel to many places that I've never foreseen before. All right. And we have a question, how many hours a week do you work? Well, we all work from sunup to sundown. Yes, that means as early as four o'clock in the morning, sometimes that is late as nine o'clock in the evening or whenever we're relieved from our duties. Yes, that's one of the many hardships and, and trials that I have to endure as an enslaved man. I am considered as such here at Mount Vernon, but throughout all of that, I try to find some form of joy and salvation in all that I do. I allow myself to have some form of diligence and pride in the position in which I hold as head butler. For when my sons uh, acquire a task, they will hopefully do the same as well. And Jeremy asks, you mentioned Mrs. Forbes. Who is that and why would you lose your living space? Well, Mrs. Forbes is a hired housekeeper. She's a bit of an overseer, I guess you could say. She will be monitoring those who work over within the mansion. She needs to have a space that accommodates her needs. So therefore the general has decided to move my wife and my three children and I out from that particular space. Now, as I stated earlier, where he has in store for us to live, I do not know, but I do hope that we are not separated. I hope that we are to remain together for they are the only family that I've ever had outside of my brother that is. And uh, we have a question. Did you know Ona Judge? Yes, I did. Well, she made an escape some time ago. I think about her quite often. She was a good friend of my wife. And you see, she made an escape on one of the general's birthdays. And he made several attempts to try to bring her back, but she decided that she'd rather live as a free vigilante than to come back to this property where she may very well be corrected or something worse. And I see a question from Lauren. She asked, how were you able to stay cool? Well, with diligence and flair, I try to 
stand underneath as much shade as I can. That sun, it's quite nice and it lights up the property very well. But if you stand underneath for too long after about five minutes, your underarms start to feel like two small ponds. Very good. And Cynthia asked, um, who is the most interesting guest to you to come through the doors of Mount Vernon and why? Oh, well, I would have to say Marquis de Lafayette. He was a frequent visitor so much to where he has his own room. I believe it's on the second floor. Well, the general considers him as a brother. Yeah, he likes to sit out on the PIP at times and gather his thoughts. Now, I've spoken to him on many occasions. Very easy going man. Very nice. Very likable, I must say. All right. And then um, we actually we have some questions for Reginald. <laughs> Scarlett asks, where can we learn more and what book recommendations do you have and other resources to learn more about, frankly? All right. Well, if you all will allow me to speak outside of character. Thank you all for the questions. My name is Reginald Richard. I serve as a character interpreter here at Mount Vernon. I've been here for a little over a year now. And this is my first Facebook live stream. I was extremely nervous, but <laughs> it is a life learning experience, and I would not trade this experience for anything else in the world. Um, as far as books that I can reference you to, I would say check out Lives Mount Together. Um, you also have um, a book on, on a judge um, that is out. Um, I would say the art of there is. There is a, a couple of books, I can't really think of them off the top of my head, but those are two really good references where you can learn about the experience that many of the enslaved endured here at Mount Vernon. Um, they are lovely pieces of literature that I've gathered a lot of information from and have, very, and have been very helpful in uh, giving me insight on how um, things really were and how they tackled those hardships and, and trials and tribulations that they experienced on a daily basis. Thank you. And Paige says, don't be nervous. You are awesome. Oh, thank you, Paige. <laughs> Everyone says, you're fantastic. Bravo. Um, Emily asks, I love the clothes. What type of research have you done to help you um, interpret, frankly? Well, we have a lovely seamstress that's on the staff. Her name is Catherine. And I can't think of her last name off the top of my head right now. But Catherine is awesome. Thank you, Catherine. <laughs> she tailor made this uniform for me. Now, this is not what, frankly, would normally wear the material that is. Now, this is linen. He would normally wear um, thin summer wool. Now, it doesn't matter if it's thin or not, it's still wool and it's high. And you can tell this is linen because of the crisscross stitching. Um, but wool would be a little heavier and it would have that furry exterior to it. Um, and it was very uncomfortable for a lot of the enslaved to wear. So during the summer heat, during the it's excruciating as it was, I'm sure a lot of them would go um, with barely anything on while working out along the property because a lot of them had skin conditions. I'm sure a lot of them, you know, didn't like the irritating uh, itchiness that came with wearing the summer wool. So they would just go without, well, they wouldn't be completely new. I don't know, I wasn't there during that time period, but I can only imagine, you know, here as a, at Mount Vernon, as a character interpreter, we can only make implications about certain things because there wasn't any documented evidence from the enslaved about how they felt or what their connections were with each other in and outside of the mansion. I'm sure there was um, issues such as colorism that took place because I'm sure some of the enslaved people that worked out in the fields and other parts of the property probably thought that life was a lot better and they probably ate better and, and because they dressed better, that things were just um, a lot a lot more comfortable for them and it was not. Um, I used to think that myself before I started here and once I read up on it, I realized that they worked just as hard if not harder and they never had a day off because they had so many guests to come in and out because a lot of people in Virginia admired and appreciated the Washington family they wanted to be around them sometimes you would have people to come and stay for a day or two sometimes people would overstay their welcome George Washington never spoke about it he would grit his teeth through his dentures <laughs> but he would he would write about it in his diaries but he would never turn anybody away because he appreciated the attention that he received Excellent. Thank you, Reggie. And uh, we just got to note, Catherine Bright Brown is the seamstress name. 
Yes. Just got that. Thank you, Captain. She <laughs> actually took me to Glass Bound together. I don't know if the museum is the, if the exhibit is still open right now, but she took me to the exhibit um, before as she was making the uniform for me to show me what they would actually wear. Um, outside of the research that I did on my own, she took me to the exhibit so I could physically see what it looked like and what I would be wearing and what to prepare myself for. So for me, I feel proud to wear this uniform because Frank Lee was not able to take it off until he was told to take it off. So for me, I can leave my job at the end of the day and, and get into my regular wardrobe, whatever that might be. I have I had a choice he did not. So for me, it's not trying to be um, a, a better, it doesn't make me a better actor. Um, it, it's a way for me to pay homage to a man that wasn't able to have a voice to speak out about some of the many things, including wearing his clothes, that he had to endure on a daily basis, both in and outside of the property. And Lives Bound Together is uh, open, um, and people can go see that exhibit yes, right now. Yes, please come out and see it because it's, uh, I don't know exactly when it's going to be closing. It's going to be closing soon. So I would recommend, um, I can't force you to, but I would recommend that you come out and experience it and experience Mount Vernon as a whole because I'm not here as a character interpreter. One thing I must say is that I'm not here as a character interpreter to discredit or to badge the Washington family, but we are to enlighten people on a part of reality that makes people nervous to discuss and uncomfortable, and it should be, because, but it's a part of history and we should know about it because the takeaway, I feel, um, should be when you leave this property, how do we make sure that this does not happen again in 2020 and years beyond? And actually, Last Bound Together has been extended into 2021, into yes. July 2021. So, yes. So, please come out and get your <laughs> tickets. Once you're okay with coming out of doors, please come and get your tickets and make your way over into Alexandria to Mount Vernon. It is a wonderful exhibit. If you want to learn any, any further information outside of what I've given you as Frank Lee speaking in first person, please come out to see it. It is a very... Um, it's very memorable experience in just walking through that exhibit. It's one of the things that I uh, I will always cherish and appreciate. Excellent. And we have time for just one more question, if you have time, Reggie. Yes. <laughs> um, so she asked, how many Frank Lees have there been? I think maybe how many actors have interpreted Frank Lee at Mount Vernon? And then what qualifications do you need to act as Frank Lee? Well, I'm not sure because I've only been here for a year, but I think I have pretty much um, set Frank Lee uh, in stone as far as like my interpretation of him. There will never be anybody like <laughs> like me as Frank Lee. Um, and I'm quite happy to say that because I've invested a lot of time and energy and put in a lot of research and figuring out who this man was um, internally and externally. And um, I'm still learning. You know, it's, it's just like being in college. Once you get your degree, you're continuing to sharpen your skills. And with me, you know, I'm still learning about the history of America and what it was to be a black man and what it was to be a black man who was enslaved in the 18th century. Um, so for me, it's an honor to be here. You know, I don't have any shame in saying to anyone that I, you know, portray an enslaved man because this man, as I stated earlier, you know, in first person managed to find some, I, I like to think, like him himself and many others, many of the 316 managed to find some form of salvation and joy despite all that they had to go through. Um, I'm sure that Frank Lee purposely created a family in hopes of having some form of legacy that he could leave behind um, because he stayed in his position until he passed away and he made the Alexander Gazette. And that showed you just how much respect people had for him Although he knew, just like they knew, just like they treated him, that he was an enslaved man. Um, but he was highly regarded and he was well respected. And that is a rare, that was a rare thing to have happen, to have a person of color, um, an enslaved man, to make, um, you know, to have an obituary in honor of him. So this man worked very, very hard. So in coming here, you know, you shouldn't feel sad about any of the enslaved. You know, now, you know, there, there are certain takeaways that I feel like that you should have, but as you walk along the property, when you decide to come, and please come, um, just know that they found joy and they found salvation and they developed love and um, within the community and within each other. Um, and they also built and maintained a majority of the property that you will experience as you walk along Mount Vernon. And they, you know, established this. Um, and so they acquired skills that they never foresaw themselves ever having. And so that was something that they could 
live for the rest of their lives with, you know, saying that they were able to build a part of America, which is still maintained today here along the property. So I don't know why you should come. <laughs> well, thank you, Reggie. Hopefully folks can come see you soon. Thank yes. you for joining us today. Yes, I look forward to seeing you all.